folks. Let's uh, get started. Open up prayer. Father, uh, we thank you for uh, these weeks you've given us and the insight into your church. And, uh, we, uh, we just pray that uh, we would not only gain an understanding of your church, but we would uh, find our place in it, Lord, and that we would uh, uh, really make it a life's mission to, to be a functioning uh, member within the body of Christ you would uh, guide us and lead us into the purpose that you have specifically chosen for us in your body, uh, allowing the gifts that you have given us to, to be used for your purpose and for your glory. And so, Father, we uh, thank you for the lessons you've given us, and uh, just bless now this class, uh, keep us alert, quicken our mortal bodies, that we can uh, be alert and, and uh, receiving Choose that you desire us to hear today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're at the conclusion. Sorry that it ended up taking 10 weeks instead of 8. But we are, uh, uh, we're essentially tonight, we're going to be talking about sort of the, the consummation of the church. Um, how do how do things end up? So we're going to getting it, we're going to be getting into some eschatology. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in eschatology. Um, for that, you will have to attend a different class. Um, I, we we do that in the uh, basic theology class. Um, how many here have, have taken the basic theology class? Anybody? You were here for the basic theology? Yeah. You've been to everything. <laughs> Not church history. Uh, no, you were here for church history. The last four or five minutes. Oh, okay. Um, I've been thinking about doing that one in the summer. So, um, all you snowbirds, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, I think, I, I'm thinking of doing that one in the summer. We'll see. Um, and I, I must have done it in the winter last time. Because the rage took it. So. A couple of years ago. So, it must have been... Yeah, I'm trying to, I try to bring that in every couple of years and, uh, and then swap it summer and winter. <clears throat> so I might do it this summer, we'll see. Uh, and then also, of course, the uh, you get eschatology and the Revelation Daniel class, which I just did. Which uh, yeah, yeah, I won't do that in yeah, a while, I just did it. But, uh, <clears throat> but we are going to be talking about end times and uh, last things tonight. But before we uh, get into some of that, um, uh, I want to talk about the kingdom, and we talked about this a little bit already. Just the the um, what it means that uh, what the kingdom is, and how we we've, we've sort of related the church to the kingdom, and um, essentially when we talk about the kingdom, uh, we are talking about uh, the reign of God and His Messiah. Okay. Now this. This takes place, I just realized something. Karen, could you do me a favor? Could you? There's a gray switch over there. Flip that up for me. This one? Not the one that says found, no, all the way over. Not the one that says found, the other one. I just realized, last time I did a class and I didn't have these guys on. There we go. I was in the dark when I looked at the video. You couldn't see me, I was in this dark shadow. <coughs> so we need the stage lights on there for you see me. So, <clears throat> Just thinking about what, what is a kingdom. A kingdom is, is a king. And there is, there is a, the people that live in, in that area that are under, that are subject to that king, that's the kingdom. The rule <clears throat> and reign of, of a king. So we're talking about God's kingdom. It's, it's, it's his rule and reign, him and, um, and the Messiah. And along with that, we think about a kingdom, there is a sense of, of individual responsibility, right? What is, again, what is my role in this kingdom? Who, who do I answer to, right? What is, what is it that is expected of me? You know, every kingdom has laws, has rules that have to be obeyed, and I need to know 
what it is that's expected of me in this in this kingdom. So there's a sense of, of individual responsibility. And when we look at the kingdom of God, <clears throat> we, uh, we can sort of look at three manifestations of the kingdom, God's kingdom. Um, and we talked about this a little bit this before, about dispensations. Remember oikonomos? That word oikonomos means house rules. Oikos means house. Nomos means the law or rules. But the house, the house rules. What is, what is the, um, you know, the, and, and again, we get the word from oikonomos, we get the word economy. What's the economy here? How do, how do things work? It's like when you get to a, you move to a new city, you find out, you know, the prices of things. Oh, things are cheaper back where I'm from, or they're more expensive back where I'm from, or I know that, you know, in this area, if I want a good pizza, I gotta go here. I gotta, you know, <clears throat> you sort of learn the rules of the area, you learn the economy, you learn um, how things work. And when we talk about dispensations in the Word of God, <clears throat> uh, again, we are not saying that God is different, that He's a different God. His characteristics and his attributes are different. No, God is God. He, there is one God. He never changes. He's always the same <clears throat> yesterday, today, and forever, from Old Testament to New Testament. But the way he manages us changes. And so we look at three of, of the dispensations in particular that relate to a kingdom. And we look at the first one, which is the, 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 the dispensation of law. Or the mosaic dispensation, um, which essentially is what is referred to as the kingdom years. Okay, so after the law was given and they entered into the promised land, okay, they were given their rules, they were given their their relationship with God, and they entered into the promised land, and they were given some responsibilities, they were given some expectations. So the place that this kingdom took place was in the promised land, it was in the Holy Land, in, in Israel. The terms were, uh, the, it, not so much the, in, in the sense of, um, by terms I mean the, the, the terminology, the terms that mean something in this <coughs> kingdom are the law and obey. Um, God basically said, in this relationship, God said, if you do this, then I will do this. If you will obey me, then I will bless you. If you disobey me, then I will curse you. And there was, this was sort of the, the relationship <coughs> that, he, that he had. These are the rules. Gave him the law, gave him the, the um, Ten Commandments and the ceremonial law, the civil law, and all this stuff, and said, you know, do these things and it will be well for you. <coughs> um, and this essentially was the kingdom of Israel. Um, the next kingdom that we see is the one that we currently live in, the kingdom of the, of the dispensation of grace. Okay, and where does this kingdom take place? Well, this kingdom takes, takes place in the human heart. Jeremiah 31 <clears throat> um, talks about, you know, um, I will put my spirit in their hearts. And I will put my law in their hearts. In Ezekiel 36, I will take away their stony heart and give them a heart of flesh. You know, there's going to be a new, a new, it's like a new sheriff in town. I'm going to do a new thing, is what he says. And this is going to be different than what I did. Instead of the law being here, the law is going to be here. You know, and I'm going to place my spirit in them. <clears throat> and the terminology that, that we see in this is believe and faith. And this is and, and this is when we when we read in the gospels Jesus talking about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, this is what he's talking about. You know, and when he says the kingdom of God is within you. Okay, he's he's not, you know, shifting over to some weird eastern religion thing. He's just saying, look, this is I'm going to rule in your heart. This is where the kingdom is going to be. The kingdom is going to be in the hearts of the men and women who, uh, who are my subjects. And it's not going to be in any one particular place. <clears throat> um, the last
vast dispensation with regard to kingdom is what often is thought of when we, you know, or what the Jews were expecting. When they saw verses about the kingdom, when they were given promises about some future time when the, the Messiah would come and reign and rule, this is what they had in mind. Um, this is going to take place on the earth, here on the world. Um, the terms are going to be righteousness and peace. Okay, that those are the things, those are going to be, the, that's the terminology that, that is going to be prevalent in that time, that Jesus is going to be here to enforce. <clears throat> you know, we, you know, we live in a wonderful time right now. Uh, this, this age of grace where God has given us much grace and God has given us liberty and, <clears throat> and room to fail. Uh, and we often think, oh, won't the, won't the kingdom of God, won't the millennial kingdom be wonderful? And listen, for us it will be. <laughs> Praise God. Because we're going to have perfected bodies. We will be uh, of a different ilk than everybody else, uh, and we will have um, had our old sin natures removed. So it'll be glorious for us. For those that live, for, the, for the, the, the mortal men and women that are living in it, they're going to be corrected on a, on a moment by moment basis. You know, righteousness is, is not going to be, it's not, it's not that there's going to be punishment, but they're going to be checked. Just in the same way that, that our heart is warned now when we sin. The Holy Spirit speaks to us gently and, and, and convicts us. Well, the conviction is going to come in person. So I think, yeah, that one's kind of low. Uh, the conviction is going to come in person and in the person of Jesus Christ uh, in a very personal way. And, and the standards are going to be high. I mean, Jesus talked about it in the, in the, uh, in the, the uh, Beatitudes. You know, that, you know, you say, uh, don't kill. But I say, if, you, if you're angry with a person, you're guilty of murder. How about that standard? You know, Jesus takes the standard. You say, don't commit adultery. I say, if you look at somebody with sin in your heart toward them, you've, com you've already committed adultery with them. Right? So the standards are going to be very, very, very high in the millennial kingdom. <clears throat> Righteousness is going to be the, the, the rule of the day. Now, <clears throat> these... These different um, dispensations are very clearly delineated because they are marked out by some significant events that I sort of, you can sort of see in between them here. <clears throat> that we had the, the dispensation of law, and the, at the end of that dispensation, we saw the cross, we saw the resurrection, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the dispersion of Israel, and the, the warning from John that the kingdom is at hand. You know, John came and said, the kingdom is, and at hand in the Greek is, a, is an interesting word that means now and not yet. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a strange word that means it is here in some fashion, but in another fashion, it's not yet here. And when you think about what, what John was saying, it really makes sense. He's like, the kingdom of God is here. Jesus is here. He is giving his word and he's here. The kingdom is here, and it is at hand. It is in front of us, and we're about to embrace it. But it's also going to have a future revelation. <coughs> we're going to have another, uh, another um, dispensation of it in another way. So it's, it's at hand, but not yet. Um, <clears throat> and then at the end of this period that we're in here, the grace period, we're going to be... The, the, the demarcation between this period and the millennial kingdom is going to be the second coming, the removal of the church, which we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, the tribulation, uh, the failure of human government, which is, you know, um, the, the tribulation. You think about this will be the first time on earth that God is going to have complete hands off to all government. To all rule and reign on this earth, and it's going to let men do what you do, whatever you want to do. I'm not going to get involved in any way. And we see the, the disaster that ensues during the tribulation. 
Um, and then the regathering of Israel. We saw the dispersal in the last break after the law. And now there's going to be a regathering, even though that they are they are physically regathering even now, that we see Israel in existence, it is, you know, but we're going to see more um, the regathering that Jesus talked about before his crucifixion when he said, Israel, Israel, I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks. They're going to get you gathered together back to the Messiah. This is going to be the, the, the final opportunity for Israel to recognize their Messiah. <coughs> um, and, then, and then comes the Millennial Kingdom. Um, one more thing to talk about is, as we sort of prepare, in order to, in order to get a visual or an idea of <coughs> um, what we're looking at in the timeline is to look at Daniel 70 weeks. And we covered this pretty, pretty extensively in, in Revelation Daniel. Um, but if we, took, if we look at it, you can turn there to Daniel chapter 9. And I'm sure this is a relatively familiar passage to most of you. But as we're sort of looking at the course of history and we're looking at the course of the church, <clears throat> I think it's important to include this. Starting at verse 24, in Daniel chapter 9. Seventy weeks, and this is an interesting word. I just, I just discovered something today. That, and I, it's, like, it's one of those things we, I've probably seen it a million times, but it never occurred to me. The word weeks there <clears throat> is actually, it's a verb. It's it's a, uh, um, it's a it's a participle, and it's it's the word seven, but it's the verb form. It's weird. It's the verb form of the word seven. Okay, so it's it's because in in you know in Hebrew, you know Shabbat. This is like Shabuah, uh, and it's sort of the verb sense of of to to because to seven something they would use that word. As, a, as, as something that means a completion, you know, a, <clears throat> um, because a week was, okay, the week's over, it's a completion, it's a, it's a, you've run the course and it's done. And so, it's like it's saying 70 sevenings, like a, like a, like a week is a sevening, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a verb that's saying that a seven happened, okay, so, <clears throat> Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make a reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of Prince, the people of the Prince who is to come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. And till the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until consum the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. So, we've got this prophecy, okay, and this kind of spells it out. And I think this, if you study this, you're going to find a couple of different scenarios that work, okay, uh, mathematically. Because depending on where you start, where you end, and how you calculate things, <clears throat> um, essentially what, what you have to do <laughs> to get these 490 years, you have to translate the 360-day Jewish calendar 
and to a 365-day Gregorian calendar, right? And um, because the 70 weeks are 70 weeks of years, so it's 77, 77 year periods, <clears throat> which says 492 years, but 490, 490 years, I'm sorry, 490 years, which, but it's, it's 490, 360 day years, okay? which brings us to 174,400 days. That's how you have to translate it. You take that number of days, that's how many days it is, and then translate that <coughs> into um, 365 day years, and that will take you from 445 BC, okay, Scott, I gotta get a battery for your pointer, I just lost, that's my green one. Um, from 445 BC, which was when Artaxerxes said, now, you know, Cyrus said, go ahead, go back, you can rebuild, rebuild Jerusalem. But Cyrus gave a decree, a written decree to go back and rebuild the walls. That's a, yeah, Artaxerxes gave a written decree to Nehemiah and said, you can go back, take this paperwork with you. This is an official decree for you to go back and do it. Okay, so if we look at that from 4045 BC um, to 32 AD is 483 years, which is when it talks about 62 and 7, right? So it's 69 weeks. April 6, 32 AD, exactly. Yeah, it goes, it goes, um, because it, it turns out to be, let's see if I, um, I didn't put that in right down, I had, I had this all worked up with it. The, um, it, it turns out to be 400, 400 and, um, because it's not 400 and, 483 years, it's like 400 and, when you, when you, you have to kick it back to 365 day years, it's like 470 something point three years. So it takes you right to um, about April, April 6th, you know, is, and, you know, we don't know for sure exactly what happened. We know that, you know, that that was, that was the beginning of, of Passover. April 6, 32 AD. That we know. We can back up the calendar and know that that was that was the day. You know, we, we can't we can't say with absolute certainty that that was the day that Jesus walked into Jerusalem and the triumphal entry. But it certainly could have been because that day was that Sunday before his crucifixion. Um, was was a Sunday before a Passover in that year and. You know, it seems like 32 AD is just about right for that time period. So it, it, it works, you know. The, <clears throat> the problem is that's only 483 years, and the whole prophecy is 490 years, so we're missing seven years. And the, the reason why this prophecy is important for the church is because of what you see in the red here. Okay? There is a, a stopwatch running. You know, when, when uh, Artaxerxes gave the, the decree, a stopwatch started, and there it goes, okay? 483 years tick, tick off, Jesus marches into Jerusalem, he is crucified, the stopwatch stops. It doesn't finish the last seven years, and we're on borrowed time. We are, you know, in... Uh, in undetermined hiatus and you know it's it's a time that's unseen that's unknown and if you've been in some of my other classes I've used this this sort of diagram um, that you say well why didn't you know they all the prophecies and nobody saw it you know and and um, it's again it's Clarence Larkin says well you can sort of look at it like this that you know here's here's the prophet 
right? And he's looking across sort of the horizon of history. And, you know, he's looking out and he sees things like the suffering servant, right? Uh, that we see in Isaiah. You know, now, they ignored it, <laughs> but, they, but they had these prophecies. And then they see, you know, the, that's supposed to be a throne. Then they see the kingdom reign, right? So what does he see? He's looking at it from his perspective. You know, it's like any, any, anybody who's now, I can say, if you've ever been out to Colorado, right? You, you see the mountains and everything looks very flat. And then as you get closer and closer, you realize those mountains are not close to each other. There's a lot of space in between them. And what we see in this area here is, is the grace of the church age, where we're living right now. And, you know, this is, this is a time that God purposely, I, I wouldn't say hid, but he obscured it somewhat. There are certainly, there are references to things in the Old Testament, but God intentionally allowed them to only see certain things and understand certain things so that this was a mystery. If anybody really wants to work out the math, there's a book called The Coming Prince by uh, Anderson, Graham Anderson. He was the head of Scotland Yard in the late 1800s, the <clears throat> Jack the Ripper time. And he figured it all out right to the, uh, to the day. Yeah. And actually, and Chuck Smith, years ago, took that and did the whole thing. And somewhere in the archives of the original yeah. Calvary Chapel and, and is Chuck Smith's uh, um, version of it. Dwight Pentecost. Is another one who's done it. Dwight uh, Dwight Pentecost. He wrote. Um, yeah, Sir Robert Anderson. A giant, a giant volume called Things to Come, and it's it's like the quintessential work on eschatology. Now, you know, I certainly encourage anybody to get it. This is not, you know, a comfortable read. This is <laughs> a very long and tedious analytical, you know, treatment of eschatology and. Uh, and he's a, he's a pretty heady guy, so it's a little, it's a little, it's kind of a very thick reading. Uh, but he's another one that sat down and worked out the, you know, did the same thing. You have to sort of, you have to translate everything over into days so that it's, so you know, that's what it is. It's those, it, that's the number of days. It's 360 day year, so 360 times 490 equals 174,400. And then I you think end it's 173,880. Well, 100, that's 483 years. That's what this is. Yeah. That's, a, that's 173,880. But you still have another seven years to go. That's how many days that is. 173,880 days from 445 to 3280. But then you get another seven years to add on to that. Uh, that's going to happen over here. That, you know, when the rapture happens, that clock is going to start back up again, and we're going to finish off those last seven years before the millennial kingdom uh, happens. Uh, I got a quick question. So seven years is actually forty-nine years. No, seven, seven years. Seven. The last is one week, because we were at this is sixty. This is I know we keep kind of saying four hundred eighty-three and sixty-nine. Right. It's seven seven. Right. There, and then seven, this, seven, seven, right. Seven, this, this is that last seven years is the is it's the, just, and the period of the Antichrist. So that's the last. Those are the last. Yeah. The last this is a little confusing. I don't know why they put seven sevens, but it's not seven sevens. It's it's um. And there's one other. Thing. It's one seven because this is this is sixty nine weeks. That's what this is. Sixty nine sevens, and this is I think this is a mis misprint. The person who made this out. This should be one seven right here. Not one seven years. Now, I, this is kind of a basic question, but something I always get confused on. Because BC is before Christ. Right. And then AD is after death? No, AD is Anno Domini. That's why it's actually, whenever you, whenever you see the dates, the proper way to do it is, we'll say, okay, 445. 445 B.C. But 32, see it's even wrong up there. It's really, it should be A.D. 32. 
which stands for Anno, Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. So he's saying that the year, that's why AD really should go first. BC goes after, goes, goes afterwards. It's because it's 445 years before Christ. This is the year of our Lord, 32. 32 years after Christ. After Christ, yeah. Even, but it, and here's the thing. Don't get hung up on those dates as being 100% accurate. They were done like a thousand years after Christ was born to figure out what these dates were when they started working out the Gregorian calendar and all that. And <clears throat> they, were, they were pretty close. I mean, for those guys, for the primitive things that they had, they were pretty close. They were probably <coughs> off by a couple of years. You know, uh, Jesus was probably born somewhere between 5 and 2 B.C. They know that they were probably off by maybe a couple of years in there. <clears throat> but, um, but essentially, that it's just been given that title now, the Pilot Domini. Um, uh, and there was, and, and, and that's why one of the things that, that you have to take into account, it's interesting, you start doing the math and this stuff, is that because if you do this math, it, it only brings you to 31 AD, except there was no year zero. You know, in the calculations, you go to 1 BC and then 1 AD. So you have to add a year. You basically, if you try to do the math, if you try to mathematically say, okay, well, what's a negative 445 and a positive 32? It, you, you fall short. But because there was no year zero, you have to, you have to bump yourself up a year. Some people try to talk about, oh, there's leap year. No, it wasn't leap year. It was just, <laughs> it was just the, <clears throat> there's no year zero. So, but it bumps you up to, because if you do it without it, you just do the math, you end up at 32, but then you get a, Add in a year because there's no year zero. Uh, brings up to 32. But that's what uh, AD stands for, uh, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. So, um, Rick, mm -hmm. the, the, what I understand is the Jews add a month every 19 years three times. Yeah. In a period of 19 years, they add one month. Yeah, they have three like, times. They have like a leap month that they do. Yeah, that's they realize they're, they're falling behind and they just they add a month, right? But that's taking all of that into consideration because it's still a certain number of days. The certain number of years is a certain number of days. And it's just, it's just what it turns out to be. Because that's how it's given. It's given as weeks of years. So you just, you know, it's, it's a pretty complicated, yeah, you have, to, you have to take a few things into consideration when you're doing it. But, um, but most, you know, most people stick to this particular calculus. Some like to take it back to 538 when Cyrus gave his decree that they could return. <coughs> but you really have to work hard to get yourself to a, to a number that, that works, you know, so. But the point of this is that this red period here is, is our period. It's the period of the church. And <coughs> um, that's, that's our kingdom. You know, this is, this is the, you know, we are the kingdom of God, we are the kingdom of heaven. The, 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 the Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit rules in our hearts, and that's the only place that that He rules on this earth. Certainly, He has, you know, He is sovereign. He is always the sovereign of this earth. But there is no rec there's no recognition of His sovereignty except among His people, among His subjects. And so, <clears throat> while we don't, you know, this kingdom doesn't have a, ge a geography. Um, it it exists within the hearts of, of those that consider themselves his subjects. So, um, so the next thing we, we move on to now, as we consider the, 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 the path of the of the church, and we get to this, you know, the end of this this period, is we start looking at the rapture and the tribulation. Um, again, I am one that does not see the tribulation that last year as another dispensation, I see it as a return to the dispensation of the law. Um, that, you know, what we live in right now is almost like an overlay or a wedge. We've just sort of wedged our way in and God has given us this time and once we're gone, 
then, you know, sort of those two times sandwiched back together again, and the last 70 years of the law uh, are taken up. Uh, but as we lead up to the rapture, as we lead up to the, the, the removal of the church, uh, we look at the last days. What, what does the Bible tell us that the last days of the church are going to look like? In 1 Timothy 4, uh, it talks about many are going to depart from the faith. In 2 Timothy 3, it says perilous times will come. And there's a whole list. You can you know, get these verses and, and look them up. All the things that he says are going to be going on. 2 Peter 3, he talks about scoffers. In those days, scoffers will come. You know, they're going to say, ah, yeah, yeah, you're waiting for the return of the Lord. You know, we've been waiting for years and years and years, and all things go on as they have. How many of you have ever heard that? Oh, yeah, I've been hearing about the return of Jesus, and it never happens. All these guys say it's going to happen, and it never happens. You know, um, and now, because of the last few guys that have done it recently, you know, people are becoming more skeptical, and we hear more scoffers. Um, That's then, right. Yep. This is, this is uh, pre-rapture, right? This is pre-rapture. This is the, the, the last days of the church. So the falling away must come first. We have that happening now. Yeah, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. I think we see it happening. Because he says the falling away must come first. You know, before, before, and let's turn there as a matter of fact, because this is going to be an important verse. 2 Thessalonians
just as whoever this man is is about to announce that I've made a treaty with Israel, we're gone. And then the treaty is announced. You know, um, we're not sure exactly how it's all going to play out. I think it's. I don't think it's going to be years. I think it's probably at most it may be months between that. I think it actually says he confirms a theory. Or yeah. A, a yeah. Uh, whatever you call it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he confirms, he confirms a confirms it. So yeah. it means it must come up maybe a week or a month before it. Well, it could be that the whole thing this is, guy's is in play, and, and, then, making, so. and then he finally confirms it. You know, at that period, uh, and it may be that that is is the result of everything this because. As if, you know, if the church is removed, if the world is going to be thrown into chaos, and, and that may be part of uh, how he rises to power, to be a, a voice of reason, and, you know, and, um, and, and, and in addition to being a voice of reason, then he, he goes and uh, makes a treaty in the Middle East, and they're thinking, okay, this is the guy, we've got to follow this guy, this guy apparently is going to be our Messiah, you know, even if they mean it in a secular sense. So, where can I hate to even ask this? Fire away. It's obvious that he's talking about the rapture here. Yep. First verse, now brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord and our gathering to him. And then he wants them not to be shaken by that letter to God. Mm -hmm. And then let no man deceive you by any means that that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Right. And the man of sin is revealed. Right. That makes me believe that he's going to be revealed before the rapture. Well, it's 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 going to be, I think it's going to be close because he says because the restrainer, he talks about the restrainer. He who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. So I don't know that this that I, I see what you're saying. <clears throat> um, I think that what, what he's referring to, you know, when he says that day will not come, okay, uh, where was that, in, for the, in, verse, in verse 3, for that day will not come, um, is what he is referring to, because that's in italic, so it's not really there, he's saying for it will not come. He doesn't even really say that day. He just says, for it will not come. And what he's referring to is the second coming. Because they were, because the Thessalonian church was told, oh, Jesus already came. Yeah. And they weren't necessarily talking about the rapture at this point. They were just talking about Jesus already came back. And it's over. You know, and that was their, that was their concern. And he's saying, that will not come. That day will not come. The second coming will not come until some of these things happen. Until these things happen. And since these things have not happened, the man of sin has not been revealed, and the falling away has not happened, then we know that Jesus could not have come. That it's, day can also be a general term. Yeah. Well, well and again, that day isn't even that day is, is there for clarification. It's not even in the original. All right. It just says it will not come. That's good because I, I believe I'm getting out of here before all that happens since 1967. Yeah. 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 Uh, Doesn't that also mean be caught up? I think? I heard some David Hawking teach on that a little bit. And he said, like, some of the translations before the 1611, the uh, King James Version, was always referenced as being caught up or raptured up. Mm -hmm. um, within that verse. Well, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll tell you what we'll do. Let's jump there, because we're going to, we're going we're gonna to talk about that, but let's, we're going to we'll do a little bit in, in reverse, okay? The translation of the living saints. Let's just, we'll, we're, we're there, we'll just talk about it. We'll talk about the rapture. <clears throat> okay, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, you know, we'll all be changed in the twinkling of an eye, right? But the, the verse you're referring to is 1 Thessalonians 4. <clears throat> starting in verse 13. And again, he's dealing with these people who are concerned that the Lord has come, and he's concerned that you know, these people who have died, you know, what's, what's happened to them? <clears throat> he says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. And that's a term that just is referring to those who have died in Christ. So, I want you to be concerned about those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive will remain until the Lord, until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the triumph, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. This is the word you're referring to. Harpazo. Okay, this is the Greek word. Harpazo. It means uh, we get the word harpoon. Because we think, what is a harpoon? A harpoon, we, we shoot it into a fish and then snatch them up. That's why, you know, harpoon's got that, that little, that, that, you know, I don't know what you want to call it. Bar. It's a barb, but it's like a, it's a barb that, you know, sort of moves. So when it goes in, and then it, you pull on it, and it, it creates that sort of anchor. So the idea is not just to, Stab them. The idea is to stab them and then yank them up. Right? That is the word, harpazo, to, to, to be caught up, to be pulled up. Now, in the, the Vulgate, in Latin, that word was translated raptuo or raptus. Okay? We get our word rapture. You know, that when we think of somebody who is in rapture, there, you know, usually it's an emotional term that we use today. That that, you know, it is a, we're all <coughs> caught up in something. You know, so it's 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 the same word. And it, it, it it's just all that it means is it means it means caught up. And <clears throat> The other place that that word is used, interestingly enough, John um, says, After these things I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice I heard was like a trumpet, okay, speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must, which must, must take place after this. And the first three chapters of the book of Revelation is taking place on earth. Everything he's talking about is taking place on earth. Uh, he is on earth while it's taking place. And we, you know, we don't know that he was literally caught up to heaven. It could have just been part of the vision. <clears throat> but um, everything took place for the first three chapters on earth. And then he says, you know, and here's that, you know, sort of the correlation. <coughs> now we hear a trumpet and a voice that says, come up here. And then all of a sudden he's up there. Right? And these first three ver these first three chapters are all about the church. And then after this, now he's in heaven, and we see the four and twenty elders. We see the twenty-four elders, which I believe represent Israel and the church. Twelve tribes of Israel, the twelve apostles, twenty-four elders, and it's representative of the saints in heaven. So John is caught up to heaven, and he's up there, and he sees all the saints. In heaven. Now he's going to look down and he's going to see all these things that are going to happen over the next seven years. That tells me we're up there. <clears throat> and he's looking down and watching the next seven years unfold. Um, we also see in chapter 3 and verse 10, Jesus makes a promise to the Philadelphia church. Now remember, the Philadelphia church is what? It's the faithful church. 
Okay, the latency in church is sort of church in name only, I think. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no sense that they may even be saved. They're just, they're a church, but, and we see it today. You know, it's, you know, we talked about this and when we um, did the history of the church. <clears throat> there's an overlap, you know, of a remnant of the Philadelphia church that exists today, and, but the predominant, uh, uh, presence of the church today is the Laodicean church, which is lukewarm and you know, and just not um, active, not seeking the Lord, and in my opinion, not a true church at all. Um, but the promise is made to, in my opinion, the remnant of the Philadelphia church, the faithful church that is still living on the earth. He says, because you have kept my commands to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial which has come upon you, uh, which has come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. And that word, I also will keep you from the hour. Ek means out from. You know, and and you know there are those that believe in the you know the mid trip or post trip. And, you know. This says out, not out from within. This says out like away from. And you will not be in it at all. I will keep you from it. <clears throat> um, and as we just read in, in Thess Thess Second Thessalonians 2 7, the restrainer is removed. The restrainer, we talked about this, is the Holy Spirit. <coughs> right? And it's not that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is, is omnipresent. He cannot physically be removed, but what is it that's removed? This is influencing power, which is the church. You know, which is that red patch of time that we saw in that timeline. That the influence of the Holy Spirit, this the kingdom of God existing on the earth today is in the church. And that's why, you know, we're really, I'm really not going to talk a lot about the tribulation in this class because there's very little in the tribulation that has anything to do with the church. You know, and we see, you know, there's movies that are out and, and I appreciate that these movies are just trying to get the word out there and trying to warn people and trying, their depiction of, of you know, the tribulation force and the, the church sort of react, rallying and all this stuff in the middle of, of the tribulation is probably a bit optimistic. I think that, that for the most part, the non-Jewish Christians are, are you know, non-Jewish believers are going to be very few and far between. Uh, and are probably going to be existing in hiding and when they're found they're going to be executed so they're not going to be around very long anyway. Uh, and it's, it's going to be a very difficult time to be any kind of a believer. Uh, the only believers that are really going to have any chance and any protection are going to be the Jewish believers because this is, you know, God says the church had to, this is not the church age anymore. We're going back to the dispensation of Israel. And this is the time of Jacob's trouble. This is the time where God is now shifting his attention and his focus and his management, his oikonomos, his house rules, are going to be focusing on Israel and his dealings with them and getting them gathered together, getting them to realize who the Messiah is. And we're going to see there's going to be a revival, if you will, in Israel among people who will see Jesus as, as the Messiah. <clears throat> um, and you know one of the other points in that, that's made in this the promise of the 70 weeks is like we saw there is a distinction there is, there is a very hard delineation between Israel and the church the two do not exist together right and so that's why it doesn't make sense that the church would endure the tribulation because it's not their time. You know, the whole point of those 70 weeks is to say that promise was made to Israel. Those 490 years was a promise to Israel. It was a timeline for Israel. The fact that we've gone on, you know, how long have we gone on now? 2,500 years plus past that promise is only because of the parentheses that we are now living in. You know, that um, God has separated out the church. And, you know, and even as we've been learning in Romans, it, you know, it wasn't that the Gentiles were allowed to join Judaism. 
it's that the Gentiles were allowed to join Christianity as the Jews were joining Christianity. You know, it wasn't it wasn't a merging of the two. He talks about the two being made one, but the two being made one under the church, not the Gentiles joining Israel. Not you know, and that's why even the whole the replacement theology is 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 is, is uh, buck because the church and Israel are separate. They're two separate entities, <clears throat> and this is you know. For lack of a better way to put it, this is our playpen right now. This is our time to do our thing. You know, God is, it's not that God has forgotten Israel, but God has sort of, you know, put them on a shelf for the time being and is dealing with his church, is doing everything through his church. And then when that time is up, the church is gone and we move into a very separate, different time and a different dispensation where God is now going back to dealing with Israel as his people, and he's going to try to regather them and regather all that he can. So that's why it's very important that that the only the only viewpoint, and I understand that people who believe in post-trib and mid-trib and partial trib and all I mean partial rapture, all that stuff, <clears throat> they have verses and they'll pull things out and they say, well, here and this and that and that, 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 that. But the only thing that really works, and we have just as many verses, obviously, that we can give <laughs> to those who believe that. It's the only thing that works. the only thing that makes sense. the only thing that fits what God is doing. And so, look, if we're wrong, we're wrong. But, you know, if I have to choose between the two, all things being considered, I'll take this one. You know? <laughs> if, you know, if, if, if there's just as much evidence, which I still think the evidence is overwhelming for pre-trib, you really have to try hard to get into a post-trib or mid-trip, or any of those other, those other ones. Uh, and I don't know why you would want to work so hard to try to make those other ones work uh, when <coughs> clearly, you know, they can't, they can't prove that, that pre-trip is wrong. So why not join the party? You know, why not, you know, believe, believe what, what's the most encouraging thing that we won't be here, okay? Not that that's a reason to believe it, but, you know. One uh, complicated factor that uh, adds to the confusion is uh, Romans 2.29 that says, But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, and the spirit not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if, I mean, it is as if um, Paul is saying that... That you become a Jew. I, you know, what, what, he's, what he's saying is that He's almost sort of saying Judaism is not an ethnicity. Judaism, or, or being a Jew, is faith. And that, not that they become Jewish, but, you know, looking at, at Judaism, or being a Jew as being God's person, being one of God's people. And that, that is through faith, and not through circumcision. It's a circumcision of the heart. It's it's, it's not a circumcision of the flesh. It's not the traditions. It's not your ethnicity. You know, it's, you know, it, it, Judaism is certainly an ethnicity. I mean, Bob's a Jew. He's, <laughs> and he's not afraid to tell everybody, you know, ethnic, ethnically speaking, but he's a believer in faith. He's been circumcised in the heart. Right. Like physical circumcision, they cut the flesh off. Right. But circumcision of the heart means your flesh is cut off. Yeah, we don't have flesh anymore. We're in spirit now. Yeah, and we're flesh. Right, right. Figure it's Just a picture. And that's why you know some. It's a picture of that. Right. It 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 is a a sort of a. That verse is using figurative language, in circumcision of the heart, so uh, it's reasonable to expect that when he's talking about being a Jew, he's speaking of being a Jew, figuratively, not. Becoming a Jew, I understand. Yeah, it's it sort of looks like it's confusing, but he's not saying that the the Gentiles join the Jews. He's just saying that the Gentiles and Jews join the church. What that means is I'm not a real Jew until I was circumcised in my heart. Yeah, true. Yeah. Means anybody I know is circumcised. Right. You know, well, it's like physically, we'll be... but I was circumcised in my heart, so I'm a true Jew. 
Yeah, like, like, like yeah, like well, what some people say, he completed you, right? Completed. Right. Whereas most people think um, this is just the opposite. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was made made you incomplete. So that is that's the rapture. That's the translation of the living saints. Now, what we read happens. It's it's part of that. The rapture is part of the resurrection. Uh, we see that the resurrection of the dead okay, happens just prior, that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive will be caught up. And this is, this is the resurrection that all the Jews knew about. This is that time when um, you know, all God's people will be joined together to be with him. Um, in John 5, Jesus talks about those, the dead will hear my voice. You know, and even in Job, Job says, I know that in my flesh I will see the Lord. He believed in a resurrection, a physical resurrection. You know, and even the Sadducees, they were, you know, they did it, you know, tongue in cheek. They did it sarcastically, um, trying to trick Jesus. Well, if in the resurrection, who, you know, this guy, he married, you know, I mean, this woman was passed along to these four brothers, and in the resurrection, who will be, you know, married to her? And uh, so there was, there was, even though they didn't believe it, they knew that it was understood. The Pharisees did that there was going to be a resurrection and a, and a physical resurrection of the dead. That you know, when we are gone, you know, we'll have perfected bodies. You know, if we, if we die before the before the rapture, you know, we will be given a perfected body. How that happens is God going to reconstitute what what's sitting in the grave, the bones and whatever. I mean, he's God, he, you know, he can be made Adam out of dust, he can recreate us out of the dust. Um, but we will be given a physical body just as Jesus had a physical body. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, you know, it says he is the first fruit of the resurrection. He's the first one to come back from the dead. You know, I mean, Lazarus came back from the dead, but guess what? He died again. You know, the widow had named her named son, he was raised from the dead, but he died again. All these people that were read, that were resuscitated died again. You know, Jesus is the only one that was raised and stayed alive in his physical body, and 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 so that he is the first the forerunner of our resurrection. You know, Revelation 20 it talks about uh, um, both the first resurrection and the second resurrection. You know, it talks about that. You know, the first resurrection happens in a couple of ways. It happens in the rapture, it happens in the raising of the, of the dead in Christ, and then it happens at the end of the, um, of the tribulation. Those saints that died during the tribulation. And he says, this is the first resurrection. These are the resurrection of the saints. The second resurrection, that's the white throne judgment. You don't want to be in the second resurrection. <laughs> second resurrection, you know, takes part in the second death. You know, uh, it takes part in, in, in eternal condemnation. They, they, when it says the sea gave up her dead, that's the second resurrection. <clears throat> um, and, you know, we also see just a more explanation of, in 1 Corinthians 15, um, that, you know, this we are so in corruption, but we will be raised in incorruption. And we're going to have perfected bodies. We're gonna, there'll be physical bodies. They're not just, you know, know what's, what's going on with those who have died right now? I don't know. I assume... They probably just have a spiritual body. They are with, with the Lord in His presence and Spirit. And, <clears throat> and that's fine. But the, the Bible tells us that we are going to be rejoined with our bodies. And we'll be given a perfected physical body. Um, so after this, after this, after the rapture, then we talk about the tribulation. You can look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Um, Mark 13, Luke 21, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, you know, talks about the tribulation. Also in Daniel, talks about this time uh, that's, that's going to be the, again, this is the, the time of Jacob's trouble. The church is not existent on the earth at this time. Um, during that time, while the tribulation is going on, we have the judgment seat of Christ, 1 Corinthians 5.10. Sometimes it's called the Bema seat. And the, beam, the word Bema doesn't occur in the Bible. It's just, you know, what they would have. In those days when people came to have things adjudicated, 
There would be someone who's acting as the judge. He would sit on this elevated seat in the middle of the town square, and it was called the Bema seat. And people would go to him, and he would make judgments. And so that's why this is sometimes called the Bema seat of Christ, where um, we are not judged for our sins. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we all must appear. 1 Corinthians 3, um, everything's going to be revealed by fire. All the, the wood, hay, and stubble is going to be burned away. Only the precious stones, gold, silver, precious stones will remain. Right? And there'll be some who will be saved as by fire, which means that they'll, they'll, they'll be saved, but they'll suffer loss of all rewards. Okay? Because that's what it is. It's a rewarding uh, of every man in Matthew 16, according to his works, it says. Not salvation according to works, but rewards according to works. Right? The crowns, the 2 Timothy 4 8, the crown of righteousness, and there's five different crowns that, that, that are talked about in the Bible that we are given for different acts of faith. Well, you know, for all that we love is appearing, for a uh, soul winner's crown. There's, there's all these different crowns. Again, Luke 14 is the, the, the recompense at the resurrection of the just. This is a rewarding of, of the faithful. Okay? And. The ironic thing is that we're just after we're given and we're going to cast it in his feet, it says so. Um, but it's just a recognition of faith. And what, what that gets translated into, who knows what that means. It may mean, you know, I've heard, heard one pastor say, you know, that, that it behooves us to, he used to put it, fatten our soul here on earth. Because the size of our soul is going to be that's something that we take with us when we go to heaven, is the capacity of our soul, our intimacy with Christ. You know, if we, if, you know, if we make it this far with Christ and then we get into heaven, well, then we start here when we get up there. If we make it this far in our intimacy with Christ and when we get up with, with him, then we start here. You know, the capacity of our soul, the maturity of our soul will... Um, will be demonstrated when we go to be with him. And I think that there is a, there's a correlation. It's not that people are going to feel left out. Nobody's going to feel cheated. Everyone's going to be very glad to be there and grateful for whatever they have and whatever intimacy they have. But I think that there is a correlation in, in heaven to the faith that we have down here on earth. I think that's probably what it's, what it's talking about here. It's talking about rewards. I don't think we're going to be carrying or putting literal crowns on our head. These are these are figurative terminologies. <clears throat> um, so that's going to be happening. Also, the marriage of the Lamb. We really don't even know what that's about, other than that is, you know, it is a, a consummation. It's a celebration that the bride of Christ, that His church, you know, and that, it, to my understanding, that is the only ones who are going to be there. You know, it won't be the Old Testament Jews, and it won't be. You know, those who have died during the tribulation. This is going to be happening sort of during that time. This is this is the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, where he marries his bride, his church. And then lastly is the return of Christ with his church in Colossians 3, 4, 1 Thessalonians 3, Jude, uh, verse 14, and Revelation 19. When he returns, it says he's going to have his saints with him. Okay? And, and again, uh, probably referring to the church. It may include the Old Testament saints. It may include those saints who died during, during the tribulation. But certainly those who are his subjects, his kingdom. <clears throat> Returning with him to reign on the earth. And that's what we see in, 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 the, uh, in the millennial kingdom. Sorry. I'll leave that out for a little bit while I talk about the millennial kingdom. You guys want to Get, jot that stuff down and take a picture of it or whatever. In the Millennial Kingdom, Revelation 1, or Revelation 20, uh, 1 through 6, it talks about a literal 1,000 years. Not figurative, not, we're not in it now. It, it's, it's very clear. It's unmistakable. All the other millennial views that are out there were twisted to fit an economy that did, that did not have in Israel. That with all that stuff, the amillennial and the postmillennial stuff was all designed because they didn't know what to do with Israel. That it talked, you know, the, 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 the um, correlated with the invention of replacement theology. 
that there is no Israel anymore. Think about it, for 2,000 years, there's no Israel. You get through all these periods of church history, and they're like, what do we do? The Bible keeps talking about Israel. Israel in the last days, Israel in the last days. There's no such place anymore. So how do we reconcile? Well, they must be talking about the church. So the church is Israel. And now in order to make all this work, now we've got to sort of twist the millennial reign around to fit that, that belief system. Well, now, lo and behold, 1948, eh, there's an Israel. You know, and here we are, some almost, it's been 70 years yet? 40, 70, 71 years. Or 71 years now that, you know, that there's been an Israel. And so there's no reason for us to be hanging on to some of those things that, that the, um, the millennial reign is a literal thousand years, just as it says in Revelation. Some things are, bit, are, are symbolic. Because they sound symbolic, but this doesn't sound symbolic the way that it's the way that it's worded. It talks about a literal thousand years, um, and this this again this reign was talked about. Yeah, get all that. Leave it up there a little longer. It'll be on the, it'll be on the website too. You can get it off the website. Um, Isaiah two, Isaiah eleven, Jeremiah twenty three. Hosea 3, all talk about the kingdom, all talk about Jesus, the Messiah, the Lord coming and reigning with his people physically on the earth. You know, this was something that Israel was looking forward to. Again, in this, in this picture, I mean, a lot of them sort of like, well, let's just forget about this, and let's just look at that. That's what we're waiting for. You know, when Jesus came, they, they were hoping, oh, he's going to come, he's going to be the Messiah, he's going to set up his kingdom. You know? And little did they know that there was going to be that parenthesis. But that's what this is now. This is the time that the Israel has been waiting for. And, and he will be, listen, Israel will be the capital. Jerusalem will be the capital of the world. Jesus will reign. David will reign in Jerusalem with Jesus. And we will reign as his governors and his, you know, uh, leaders and representatives and whatever Whatever form of government he sets up, he will, uh, you know, we are going to be reigning and, and ruling with him. In this time, we see, uh, particularly in Revelation 20, it talks about those, uh, let me turn there real quick, just as we wrap things up, Revelation 20, in verse 4, and I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, and for the word of God, who had not been worshipped, who had not worshipped the beast, or the image, and had not received his mark on his forehead. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So it's not just the church, but also those who, and probably, and obviously, saints of Israel, Old Testament saints, because David is going to reign. And, uh, and those who, who made it through the tribulation, or, are, or, or rather were beheaded during the tribulation, kept their faith through the tribulation, were beheaded for their faith, um, <clears throat> will reign with Christ. But they'll be brought back in, yeah, in an immortal form like we will have. And but everybody else is going to have their mortal form. You know, that we'll see that at the end of the... Um, the end of a thousand years, you know, they're going to repopulate the earth and Satan is going to come back and tempt them again and some people will fall and then and then that'll be it. And then we enter into, and again, I'm not trying to skip over it, but it doesn't really relate to the church. It's more of an eschatological uh, thing, so it doesn't really necessarily really relate to the church. But the last thing is just the new heaven and the new earth. Revelation 21 um, is set up and the new Jerusalem comes down, and sometimes I think there's a misunderstanding that this is the church, because it says it's adorned as a bride. But it's not saying that's not really the point of it. The point of it is not that this is the church. It's just it's it's, it's just a description of, of how it is adorned and prepared, uh, because more than just the church is going to be living in the New Jerusalem. Um, that there's going to be all the saints. All, you know, all the ones that it talks about those who are not going to, really talks more about those who are not going to be allowed. No sin is going to be allowed. No, you know, uh, idolatry is going to be allowed. 
uh, in that <coughs> in that city, um, and it's just going to be a uh, big queue, a fifteen hundred mile queue, and you know it's 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 probably difficult for us to imagine, but it's it's not going. I don't think it's going to be a box. I think it's going to be a city that is just high. If you've seen some pictures of it. Because it's not, you know, it's, it has walls, so the walls are only 300 feet high. You know, the walls are 300 feet high, but the city itself is 1,500 miles high. You know, so it's, you know, it's big. I mean, think about, you know, what is it from here to, what is it from here to New England? It's about almost 1,600 miles, right? Maybe a little, a little over 1,600 miles, but maybe all the way to you guys. Maybe, maybe. It's about Okay, I was going to say maybe about to Connecticut. It's, it's probably about 1,500 miles from here, right? So from here to Connecticut, so it's about half the United States. It's actually bigger than most, and then high, 1,500. It's going to be in space, in 1,500 miles high. You're, you're, you know, you're out there. But again, it's a new heaven and a new earth and a different, whole different thing. But it's not just solely the church. I just I wanted to include that so it's not a misunderstanding that. Even though it's it says adorned as a bride, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's specifically the church. So, with the new heaven and the new the new earth, the earth as we know it, like so beyond that 1,500 miles, there'll be nothing on the earth. I don't know. You know, I mean, there are some things that aren't that haven't been haven't been clarified. Uh, I don't think that we're going to be prisoners of that of that 1,500 mile. Thing that we're going to have the universe at our disposal, but I think that is going to be, you know, our capital city. That will be our dwelling place. You know, when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, I think it's in that city. And you'd be surprised how many people can fit in 1,500 cubic miles, you know. Um, <coughs> I, did, I did the math one day, and if it's 1,500 by 1,500 cubes, and it comes out to a, more than a half of cubic mile per each of seven billion current population. <coughs> if there's seven billion. It's massive. Yeah, if there's seven billion that, that get in. Yeah. No, no, I'm saying just yeah. using Just using number. today's numbers of the whole number, world. Yeah. yeah, I mean, to take today's population could, you know, just reasonably just fit in 1,500 square, you know, cubed miles, yeah. You know, I heard one guy talk about <coughs> Uh, when people complain about the overpopulation of the earth, it was a like Ken Hovind says this. He says, he says, you could fit the entire population of the earth inside Loch Ness. I mean, just end to end, people, person to person, squeeze them in side by side, you could fit them inside of Loch Ness Lake in Scotland. The entire population of the earth. He says, if it's, if it's crowded, if it's overpopulated where you live, move. You know, go, to, go to Montana and say that it's overpopulated. You know, go to northern Maine and say say it's overpopulated. There's a lot. There's a lot of open space on this earth. Um, but um, so yeah, you can fit a lot of people in 1,500 cubic miles. So uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a big place. And I don't know. I don't. You know, maybe we won't want to leave. Maybe we'll be. You know, because we're in the presence. Because there is no temple. It says there is no temple in this place in that city because you know he is there. We don't need a temple. We don't need to go anywhere. He is there. He is with us. We are his people. You know, so maybe we won't want to leave that city. Maybe that city will be everything we need and everything we ever want. You know, it's 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 a different reality. It's a different sense of of of, of existence. So um, I'm correct, you know, God is a day of a thousand years. There's a time and space going to be. Yeah, there's not even going to be time anymore. So so we're going to be living outside of time, so there won't even be you know, what that even means, yeah. that there won't be the passage of time that will exist in the past, present, and future all at once. You know, again, some of this stuff just starts to make your head hurt if you think too much about it. You know, but the um, last thing I want to read is in Revelation 22, in verses 12 to 14. And this is, you know, and this is um, a call to the church. And if you have a New King James, it even has a little bit of a little, little title up there. It says, Jesus testifies to the churches. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone.
according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And so, you know, he is coming, and, you know, part of his coming, the first step of his coming is to come to his church, is to come for his people, for his kingdom, for his subjects. And, you know, he's saying here, be ready. You know, I want to give you a reward for your works. Um, be, uh, be aware of my coming and be ready to, uh, to present to me the, the works that, that you've done for me. And, and again, it's not, you know, we're not on, it's not a works program. Anything that we've done in the flesh, any works that we've done in the flesh, that's all the wood, hay, and stuff. It's not, it's not about, you know, the things that we've generated in our flesh. It's what have we done in faith. Everything that we have done in faith is the silver, gold, and precious stones. And, uh, and this is our time. This is our playpen right now. And it's our opportunity. And we're not always going to have it. And it, it behooves us to take advantage of the time that's, that's given us. Before he returns. Questions? Question. Yes. When you use the word falling away, mm -hmm. falling away of true believers, even elders, true believers, or those who may have saved in their own mind. Okay. Away. <laughs> <laughs> That's for God to decide. You know, uh, I think that there's a, it's a falling away at the very least of what is called the church what is called Christianity. You know, it could it could very well be true believers. It could be those who professed but didn't possess. Uh, you know, I mean, we... Well, that may not be a true believer. We profess, but... Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, it's like what Pastor Bill shared, um, was it this past week or the week before? It was the week before. You know, when he talks about who will enter into the kingdom, who will inherit the kingdom. And he gives a list of people who will not inherit the kingdom. You know, in, in Galatians chapter 5, you know, all these wicked sins that are listed, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom. You can, you can interpret that however you like, but that's what it says. You know, because is it talking about, you know, Somebody who was saved, he's talking about somebody who was never saved. We don't even have to go there. We don't even really have to try to thread that needle. You know, we just, I know this. If I'm not practicing those sins, I'm okay. You know, if I'm practicing, if I'm practicing those sins, whether or not I'm saved at some point sort of becomes irrelevant. I can't know that I'm saved. If I'm living a life of sin and I don't care about it, you know, am I saved? Am I not saved? That's for God to decide. I know this. I can't know that I'm saved. I can't have any sense of security. I can't have any sense of assurance just because I said a prayer of Billy Graham, you know, you're saved. And I'm living a life of sin. God says, don't tell me you're going to heaven. I just told you that if you're living that way, if you're practicing that way, you're not in heaven. Yeah, it's clear. You know what I mean? It's, it's, you know, God, fortunately God doesn't, that's, that's, that's always been Chuck Smith's position. So some of you who were in the, in the, um, the uh, distinctives class, we talked about that, that, you know, Chuck decided not to thread that needle. He decided, I'm, it's, I'm not the one to decide some, if somebody is saved, if they are not saved anymore, if they were never saved. I, I, you know what, God didn't ask me to do that. God said, told me to abide in Christ and to, to not practice these sins. And then I can know, you know, if I'm abiding in Christ, I can know that I'm saved. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, that's the bottom line. Any other questions? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the time you've given us. Uh, Father, help us to make the most of the time that you have given us to be your church, to be your people, your subjects, your witnesses, and your kingdom here on the earth. And let us let us be that restraining force. That, that influence of your Holy Spirit on the earth today. And um, help us to be just your servants in everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.